lot of um, kind of basic things about cornea. So feel free to stop me at any time. Uh, so I'll go over the basics of corneal anatomy, pathophys, um, some basic slit lamp techniques, and really common um, con corneal conditions that you'll see, uh, primarily on call, and also um, in the clinic, and then some special cases, most particularly with um, burn unit pathology, which you'll see here. Um, so as you know, cornea is an avascular transparent tissue that measures about 11 to 12 millimeters horizontally. And it has a orientation that's called a prolate kind of configuration where it is actually steeper um, kind of in the center part of the cornea and less steep in the periphery. So it's termed prolate. Um, if a cornea has undergone, um, say, myopic refractive, uh, corneal refractive surgery, it will become flatter in the center, steeper in the periphery, and that's termed an oblate cornea. And the cornea has a very high density of nerve endings, which is why when there's any sort of injury, it's very, very painful. Um, so this is a cross-section of the cornea. So the epithelium has about four to five um, cell layers thick of stratified squamous epithelium that's held together by tight junctions. Um, and then the, there's a basement membrane to this epithelium. And then there's an unlabeled structure underneath that's um, called Bowman's layer. And this is an acellular structure, which is sometimes called Bowman's membrane, but it's not a true membrane. Um, it's actually acellular. Um, the bulk of the cornea um, is comprised of the stroma, which um, has several um, keratocytes, which have to be specifically arranged so that um, the cornea can remain transparent. And also it needs a very um, tightly regulated kind of concentration of water so that um, it also remains clear. Uh, the endothelium uh, has an endothelial cell pump, which uh, pumps out um, fluid out of the cornea to keep it clear. And the basement membrane to the endothelium is Desmase membrane. So this is a true basement membrane. Bowman's membrane isn't really a real membrane. All right, so next, the tear film also has layers. Um, there's a top uh, lipid layer, then there's an aqueous layer, and a bottom mucin layer. And the top lipid layer is produced by the meibomian glands um, in the eyelids. And this is responsible for preventing the tear layer from evaporating, so it's very important. And we'll talk about conditions where the meibomian um, glands can be affected. Um, the aqueous layer comprises the main bulk of the tear film and is produced by the main lacrimal gland and also the accessory lacrimal glands of Krauss and Wolfring. The bottom layer is the mucin layer, which is produced by the conjunctival goblet cells. Um, and it is very important to actually allow the tear film to stick to the ocular surface because otherwise the tears would be made, they just fall off the ocular surface and they're not really um, hydrating the ocular surface. <clears throat> and the mucin layer is uh, stuck down uh, to the ocular surface, to the epithelial cells, um, as shown here. Um, <clears throat> again, this is kind of a potpourri of, of various topics in cornea, so we're gonna switch gears to slit lamp um, exam. Um, and here are the common um, techniques for examining um, the eye. So, um, you, so usually, you know, when you first start out looking at an eye, you want to start with kind of a lower mag, um, not super intense light, kind of a broad beam of diffuse illumination. This is just to get an idea of is there anything there that I need to concentrate on. So just kind of get a broad overview. Um, so then um, you can get down to slit lamp illumination, um, where we actually have the beam at a uh, kind of with a slit and at an angle. And this allows you to see uh, depth um, and to you can go on high mag to identify uh, more subtle findings. Um, so diffuse illumination and slit lamp illumination are by far the most common techniques um, that are used in examining, uh, in the slit lamp examination. Um, specular reflection um, is sometimes, is most commonly used to examine um, really fine details around endothelium. Um, so what's done is that you have the beam at a very high um, intensity at about a 60 degree angle. Um, and then you kind of have to superimpose the light, um, the light bulb reflex with the actual slit beam so they're together. And then you focus in and you can kind of see reflections around this very bright light um, to look at endothelial cells. Um, sclerotic scatter is a method where you, again, have a very intense bright beam at an angle and you shine it right at the limbus and it, you have it at such an angle that you can actually light up um, a little bit of the whole cornea. And so this 
picture is showing um, a light corneal scar here that's lit up by sclerotic scatter. So the scar isn't like, the beam isn't really on the scar, it's just kind of highlighted um, by light that's scattered from the limbus. Uh, retroillumination is something that um, I use fairly commonly. Um, you, most commonly I use it to look at iris defects, so this is showing some diffuse um, iris defects here. Um, so it's a good way to look at, um, to see whether or not you have a patent uh, peripheral iridotomy. Um, you can also see fine um, details in the lens and the cornea with retroillumination. And what you do is you have your beam kind of um, straight on um, into the eye, going into the pupil. And so what um, reflects back, um, you can see um, kind of reflected back here. Um, corneal stains, <clears throat> most commonly, by far, we use fluorescein. It comes in solution or strips, and this stains basement membrane, as shown here. Um, Rose Bengal um, stains devitalized cells, and it, it's easy to see um, not only devitalized cells in the cornea, but also the conjunctiva. Uh, Lissamine green, I probably um, would use um, rather than rose bengal, it does the same thing. It stains, divide, uh, stains divide cell, devitalized cells, um, but it's much less irritating than rose bengal. Rose bengal, people feel it actually stings even with topical um, anesthetic. Um, assuming green doesn't stain, uh, sting quite as much, and you can see um, the very, very green um, highlighting some conjunctival staining here. Um, kind of this is. I'm sure you guys know this on call, but just to review some miscellaneous exam things, especially on call. So you want to remove soft contact lenses um, prior to instilling any fluorescein, so you always want to ask the patient, just to be sure. Um, you want to keep track of your preparocaine, tetracaine, and your um, fluorescein solutions um, because um, patients can steal them and leads to uh, topical anesthetic abuse. Um, anyone with, uh, especially like a unilateral red eye, you want to flip their upper lids um, if someone has a corneal abrasion or flip, um, sometimes you're surprised by what you find underneath. You might find a foreign body um, or some other cause of their corneal abrasion. Um, so I'll go into some common uh, corneal and conjunctival issues, um, both acute and chronic. So conjunctivitis um, is classified typically into three categories, bacterial, viral, and allergic. Um, and there's various bumps that you'll see on the uh, tarsal conjunctiva with um, the various conditions. Um, with bacterial conjunctivitis, typically you'll see a very purulent discharge. Um, follicles are, are shown here. These are actually clusters of lymphocytes um, where you see uh, kind of the vascular vascularity kind of surrounding a follicle. So you see the vascularity kind of on the periphery. And you'll see follicles uh, typically in viral conjunctivitis. Um, and, and in viral conjunctivitis, there's typically a history of either uh, upper respiratory um, symptoms or sick contact, uh, contacts, and they'll typically have the symptoms in one eye, and then it goes to both eyes. Um, papillae are shown here. So papillae are actually um, dilated uh, capillaries, which um, kind of are in the middle of each bump of each papillae. And then each capillary is surrounded by edema. So follicles, you see the vascularity in the, in the periphery. Um, in papillae, you'll see the vascularity in the center. And you'll see papillae uh, typically with allergic conjunctivitis. Oftentimes, you don't get a nice classification like this where you see all follicles and all papillae. Um, it's common to see a mixture of both. So you don't always get this nice distinction. But um, if you do see you know, uh, kind of a, a bigger concentration of either the follicles or papillae, then you, that, that'll kind of clue you into what the diagnosis is. Um, and this is an example of giant papillary conjunctivitis, um, which is seen commonly in, um, as a reaction in contact lenses. So again, very important to flip the upper lids because you could find something like this. <clears throat> um, next is episcleritis. So this is defined as a benign transient inflammation of the ocular surface in episclera. Um, the history is that they'll have, um, patients will have a red eye, um, but there's not really much pain. It's pretty minimal if there is any pain. And on, on exam, when you put in some phenylephrine, um, it typically will blanch. Um, I don't usually work up episcleritis patients unless they are recurrent. Um, it can be associated with um, autoimmune conditions as well as other conditions here. So here are some systemic associations. Again, these are kind of 
single digit percentages of systemic associations with herpes zoster, collagen vascular disease, gout, and syphilis. Um, so you can check lab work if needed. Um, episcleritis is typically self-limited, so it can actually go away without any treatment. Um, but you might consider some uh, PO NSAIDs or some topical NSAIDs or steroids to maybe speed the resolution. Um, in um, contrast, scleritis is something that's very um, different. So in scleritis, um, there is typically very um, kind of intense pain, is very, very tender. So, you know, you can also, you can push, if you're not sure if you've got scleritis or episcleritis, you can just kind of push um, on the globe through the lid and ask them if it's tender or not. And with scleritis, it's going to be, you know, they're, they'll be going to be jumping out of their seat if you do that. Um, when you put in phenylephrine, there's typically no blanching seen. And there are a few types of scleritis here. Um, you got non-necrotizing, um, necrotizing without inflammation, um, or scleromalacia perforans, which is actually painless. It's the one type of scleritis which is painless. And then you have necrotizing um, scleritis, um, as seen here, so where there's um, severe thinning of the sclera. And this is typically seen in um, uh, Wegener's, which is polyangiitis. I can't remember the, the new name for it. Um, and scleritis is a very, very um, high um, association with systemic disease. Um, so yeah, here are the systemic associations, um, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriasis, Crohn's, um, the vasculitides, um, syphilis TB is always on the differential. Um, with scleritis, you always want to work it up, even if it's a first time um, episode of scleritis, and you can use history to guide testing, as seen here. Um, occasionally, if labs, labs are negative, you could re um, consider repeat testing in one year. Um, with non-necrotizing scleritis, this is the least severe form. Um, you'll see a violaceous hue, um, and there is a 50% association with system systemic disease, and 50% of cases are bilateral. Um, and this does not go away if you don't treat it, so it's going to remain until it's actually treated. Uh, scleromalacia perforans, again, this is the type of scleritis that's without inflammation or it's actually painless. Um, so you see a painless white quiet eye with thin sclera, typically seen in the elderly. It's very typically bilaterally. 50% um, of these cases are actually from rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, scleral rupture is rare, um, and it rarely needs surgical repair, but... Um, there does need to be, um, obviously, systemic immunosuppression, which I'll talk about later, I think. Um, necrotizing scleritis with inflammation is painful. It's bilateral um, in most cases. This is the most destructive type with vision loss in 40%, um, a high association with systemic vasculitis. And the mortality rate of this is high. It's actually 20% at five years. So it's really important to um, diagnose this um, so they can start treatment. Um, contact lens abuse. <laughs> something that, which you'll very commonly see on call. Um, you've got a history where um, someone is wearing their contact lenses long periods of time during the day. Most commonly, they're sleeping in their lenses. They've got poor hygiene. Um, and this is, you know, I'll, I'll talk about cornea ulcers, but this is not quite um, ulcer stage. Um, you'll see these small, fine subepithelial opacities that look like this. They'll typically be bilateral. Um, there'll be some conjunctival injection. Um, treatment of this will be with um, artificial tears, having them stop their contact lenses until symptoms resolve. Um, you could consider a mild steroid drop, um, but really important to get these patients in for follow-up in the clinic um, so that we can see that their um, symptoms have resolved and that it's not turning into an ulcer. Uh, which leads me into the next topic of corneal ulcers. So this, um, the most frequent risk factor to a corneal ulcer is contact lens use. Um, other risk factors include uh, previous eye injury, previous trauma, um, if they are a healthcare worker or in a nursing home, um, concurrent um, ocular surface disease like severe dry eye, um, if they are immunosuppressed. And you do want to get a history of the degree of their pain, the duration, if they've been using any other eye drops at all or if they've been seen by other practitioners um, and, and received any um, prescription drops. Uh, bacterial um, etiologies are the most common, and typically there's very quick onset. Um, you'll also uh, see uh, cases of um, viral um, ulcers, fungal, and also parasitic with acanthamoeba. 
So when you look at a corneal ulcer, there are different characteristics that you want to look out for. You want to look at the location. Is it central? Is it paracentral? Is it peripheral? Typically, it's helpful to have a clock hour on there so that um, when you look at the ulcer later on, you can find it again. Um, is it the shape? Is it round? Is it oval? Is it stellate? Um, you want to measure the size. You want to assess the depth. Is it panstromal? Is it uh, anterior, meaning it's just kind of very superficial? Is it only deep or endothelial? Um, and the density or consistis, consistency, is it really dense? Is it like super white and opaque? Or is it kind of light and feathery? Um, and noticing kind of the borders of it um, is important um, as well. And I also like to know whether or not there's an associated inflammatory response, like is the surrounding cornea very kind of hazy and kind of edematous, or is the surrounding cornea very, very clear? And that gives you an idea of how much inflammation there is. So if there's a lot of haze around it, there's a lot of inflammation. If there's not really any haze, um, you know, maybe this is an ulcer that's either very indolent or very concentrated, or maybe it's kind of turning more into a scar. <clears throat> so when do you want to uh, culture a corneal ulcer? So if it's large, and I guess large is, rel is relative, but I'd say if you've got something at least two millimeters, that would be considered large. Is it vision threatening, meaning is it in the central visual axis or close to it? Um, even if it's a small ulcer, I would culture. Um, if anytime there's a hypopion, you do want to culture. And any post-operative patient, um, like a post-cataract or post-corneal transplant, you definitely want to culture. So um, if in doubt, just culture. And there are different ways of um, culturing. Traditionally, when you read kind of in the textbooks about culturing, they use something called a chimera spatula, um, or you can use um, something called a calcium alginate swab, which is like a kind of a smaller Q-tip. Um, you use this to scrape into the infiltrate, and then you um, plate it out uh, in a thin layer onto culture plates and you use a separate swab for each plate. Um, and you can send off the cultures for gram stain, um, blood agar, which is aerobic bacteria, chocolate agar, which is marine Neisseria and Haemophilus, Saboroids agar for fungi, uh, thioglycolate uh, broth for anaerobic bacteria, um, Pages Media, something we use here for acanthamoeba. So if you ever want to culture acanthamoeba, you do have to get this um, kind of separate thing called Pages Media comes in a tube, it does not have its own swab, so you have to kind of hunt down a separate swab. I've heard of people opening up the viral culture media just because that comes with the swab, so you can use that swab for the pages media. So kind of confusing. Um, typically nowadays I don't use the um, traditional plates. I use something called the e-swab, and this is very easy because everything's kind of all in one, and everything means kind of the non-viral, non-acanthamoeba. Um, so the e-swab is a nylon tip swab which has um, kind of these kind of longer fibers which can improve um, sample collection because there's more, uh, kind of grabs onto the uh, culture, uh, whatever you're culturing a little better. Um, and this is placed in a medium um, in a tube that looks like this. And then when you send it to the lab, you put in your orders and the lab will actually aliquot it for um, culture. Um, it is not inferior to traditional collection methods with regards to culture positivity rate. Um, I first started using these maybe three or four years ago, and I, when I first started using it, I actually would culture same patient twice, like once with traditional and once with the e-swab. Um, and I found that the e-swab would actually um, have yield, whereas the uh, traditional plating may not have yield. So you might get a better yield with the e-swab. Um, so how do you want to treat a corneal ulcer? Um, it's going to depend on how bad it is. So um, typically I would start if it's not too severe, um, just with a fourth generation fluoroquinolone. You know, if it's tiny and peripheral, I might just go QID. If it's a little more severe, you'll go Q1 hour. Um, or um, if it's more large or severe, I would go with fortified antibiotics which can be compounded at the Moran Pharmacy and also our inpatient pharmacy. Um, and there's, it's in, on formulary, so you can just type in vancomycin and tobramycin, and it'll come up as um, these concentrations. Um, and you do want to choose these, and using these every Q1 to two hours. 
Um, you can consider a cycloplegic agent, and here are the most commonly used ones. Cyclogel lasts about 12 hours, so use it BID to TID. Um, home atropine, um, typically use BID, and atropine, 1%, you can use um, once or twice a day. But atropine, um, home atropine, I don't think people can find very much anymore, so I'm usually using cyclogel or, or jumping to atropine. And with atropine, I always tell them, you know, make sure you don't accidentally put it in your other eye because they're going to be dilated for like seven to ten days. So it's really important that you tell them to keep, the, I mean, they always, they always have to keep their drops in the one eye, whatever eye it's supposed to be. But with atropine in particular, I've had patients accidentally put it in their good eye and then they're wondering why they're dilated. Um, any patient who, you know, may be homeless or has a questionable home life and maybe not able to get in their drops Q1 hour, you might consider admitting as an inpatient. Um, herpes simplex keratitis is very common. Um, symptoms are kind of nonspecific. It's redness, blurry vision, some irritation, or you could have severe pain with it. Um, there is diminished corneal sensation, so you want to check this prior to placing anesthetic. And I like to check uh, corneal sensation by taking like a cotton swab, and you know, with clean hands, you can kind of rip or kind of kind of wisp off like a little top layer of it, so you have a little wispy kind of edge and then have a patient look straight ahead mm -hmm. and touch both sides and ask them, does one side feel more irritating than the other? Or you can kind of see on their reaction, like if you're touching and they're not even blinking, you know they have decreased corneal sensation. Um, so on exam, there's very ty various types of herpes simplex keratitis. There's epithelial disease where you see a dendrite here. And classically, you'll see terminal end bulbs at the end of each dendrite. Uh, stromal, um, HSV keratitis is actually the most common cause of infectious corneal blindness in the U.S. There's not really a, I mean, a specific characteristic look. It's just kind of more of some haziness. And oftentimes, it's kind of patchy, as seen here. Um, discoform keratitis, you'll actually see corneal edema, so it's affecting the endothelium. So classically, you'll see stroma edema in a round distribution. Um, it's kind of oval here, and it's associated with keratic um, precipitates and um, it's also been termed endotheliitis. Um, so the treatment of, of epithelial disease, most cases actually resolve spontaneously. I don't typically have them go off without treatment. Um, so you want to use some kind of um, antiviral treatment. Classically, um, topical trifluoridine eight times a day. I I've kind of shied away from this just because it can be quite toxic. Um, you can use Zergan gel five times a day. Unfortunately, it tends to be quite expensive. Um, so usually with oral um, treatment with either acyclovir or Veltrix, um, you can achieve um, good uh, penetration to the cornea. Uh, classically with HSV, the dose is 400 milligrams five times a day. I've seen um, people do 800 BID just to kind of consolidate things and make things easier. Um, typically, you don't want to use a steroid, any topical steroid with um, epithelial disease. Um, you could consider epithelial debridement if it's not resolving with um, treatment. Um, there's the HEAD study, which is a study which looked at um, the use of uh, topical trifluoridine and steroids and, acyc and acyclovir. So the purpose of it was to evaluate the efficacy of um, treatment in um, HSV stromal keratitis and HSV iridocyclitis. So they looked at seeing whether or not topical steroids steroids with topical trifluoridine was effective in stromal keratitis, if oral acyclovir with topical steroids and trifluoridine was effective, and whether um, oral acyclovir with steroids and trifluoridine were effective in iridocyclitis. Um, so the results showed that when you have HSV stromal keratitis, when you give topical steroids with um, topical trifluoridine, it actually reduced the progression and shortened the duration. Um, there's no benefit of adding oral acyclovir um, when you already have um, when you have stromal keratitis and you're already treating with topicals, uh, steroids, and antiviral. Typically, I do like adding oral acyclovir um, just because later on it kind of helps prophylax. Um, but there was a trend to suggest a benefit of oral uh, acyclovir with topical steroids and trifluoridine in HSV iridocyclitis, but. I don't think the head study had enough patients in this arm to really say for sure, but I think typically people do add oral antiviral treatment for this. 
Um, so these are the doses of um, prophylactic doses for HSV, keratitis, for acyclovir, famvir, and uh, Valtrex. So with acyclovir, again, the treatment dose was 400 milligrams five times a day, and the prophylactic dose is 400 milligrams two times a day. Um, Valtrex treatment dose would be one gram BID. Prophylactic dose is one gram once a day. Uh, late complications of HSV keratitis are neurotrophic cornea. Um, you can have severe dry eye. You can have non-healing epithelial defects. Um, you can have severe corneal scarring, neovascularization, recurrent inflammation, and corneal thinning. Um, and its sister disease, shingles, is very um, similar. Um, the, uh, so zoster is a reactivation of latent um, VZV, and um, there is, uh, in, when it's affecting the eye, there is uh, in, involvement of the ophthalmic division of cranial nerve 5, and the classic sign is Hutchinson sign, where if there's involvement of a shingles rash at the tip of the nose, that means the nasociliary nerve is involved, and the nasociliary nerve innervates conjunctiva, cornea, sclera, iris, choroid, and the skin of both eyelids, and so it's a very strong predictor of ocular inflammation if you see a positive Hutchinson sign. Um, shingles is most... Uh, or zoster is more commonly in the elderly, although we are seeing it more and more in young patients. Um, there's a wide range of ocular involvement in severity and maybe acute chronic or relapsing. And you'll see a pseudodendrite. So un unlike HSV, where you see a very classic, nice kind of pretty tree, um, in this, in, with pseudodendrites and shingles, um, kind of more of a stuck-on appearance. There aren't any terminal end bulbs. Um, and um, you can see stromal keratitis. Like HSV, there's going to be decreased corneal sensation. So if the zoster symptoms started within the previous 72 hours, um, you want to start, and actually I, I don't even wait, you know, if it's beyond even beyond 72 hours, I would probably start this dose. So this is double the dose of HSV uh, keratitis. So with zoster, you want to go to 800 milligrams um, five times a day for 10 days. And we think that there is a role for reduced dose long-term, um, which is the topic of a um, clinical trial going on right now called the ZEDS trial, which we are a site. Um, there may be a role for a topical antiviral treatment. Um, and topical steroids are highly, highly recommended for um, anterosegment inflammation and keratitis. And oftentimes, you need a very slow taper of topical steroids or even chronic use to prevent um, recurrent inflammation. And um, with shingles, you see post-herpetic neuralgia, which is kind of severe pain even after all the uh, um, kind of the signs of zoster have gone. And this pain can be very severe um, and can be treated with gabapentin, uh, tricyclic antidepressants, and Lyrica. So I will always refer patients out uh, to see their primary care doctor and maybe also a pain specialist to help manage these symptoms. Um, you get the same late complications in um, zoster um, as you do with HSV. So neurotrophic cornea, scarring, neovascularization, recurrent inflammation, and corneal thinning. Uh, next, corneal trauma. So the most common type of corneal trauma that you'll see is a corneal abrasion. Um, I'll treat with a fluoroquinolone four times a day. I don't change my treatment based on the size of the corneal abrasion per se as far as the antibiotics go. So don't do like fluoroquinolones Q an hour when it's really just abrasion, no, no infiltrate based on the size. Like if it's a total corneal epithelial defect or a tiny one, I just do fluoroquinolone four times a day. Um, you can consider a cycloplegic, cycloplegic agent for pain control. Um, you can also consider a bandage contact lens or a pressure patch. And you wanna follow closely for um, any infiltrates that can develop uh, down the line. Um, if there's no trauma history, you do want to examine for exposure. Is there any like ophthalmos or is there something under the lid that might be scratching? So you want to examine for other causes for a corneal abrasion. Uh, corn foreign, corneal foreign bodies are very common. Um, oh, question. Yeah, would you, you would always use a fourth generation, like a fourth generation, no matter like the um, the or... I mean, I guess you could use like a polytrim. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. Or? Yeah, just like if it's like a ground source versus say like a, a burn or something like that. I usually like the fluoroquinolones. Yeah, I usually do. If it's um, 
the only times I don't is if there's allergy, if there's like an insurance kind of cost issue, I'll go polytrim. Um, but typically I do flor uh, floquinones. Um, corneal foreign bodies, uh, metals most common. Um, if it's superficial, um, you can remove these with a 27 or 30 gauge needle. Um, you can consider using a burr um, as well. Afterwards, you treat it like an abrasion, but it is common to have like this kind of, kind of a white, almost looks like an infiltrate that's usually sterile, kind of in the, in, in the spot where the uh, foreign body was. So if there is a little bit of a kind of a white appearance there, you can use a combination of antibiotic and steroid, but you want to follow these patients to make sure they're not developing infection. Um, if it's really deep, you don't want to pursue that, um, and you always want to counsel patients on eye protection. Uh, corneal lacerations. So you want to determine, very importantly, if it's partial or full thickness. Like, is this a ruptured globe or not a ruptured globe? So you can use a Seidel test to tell that. You can look at the anterior chamber depth. Like, it's a, if it's shallow, you know, that's a clue that there is a full thickness situation going on. And if you're not sure about the, the depth, like, you know, what's normal for this eye, look at the patient's other eye. And so if the other eye is, you know, kind of the same AC depth as the affected eye, feel good. If the other eye is a lot deeper, then um, there's probably a full thickness um, laceration going on. Obviously, if there's peaking of the pupil or iris prolapse, then that's a very obvious sign of full thickness laceration. If there's a partial thickness laceration, you want to remove or irrigate any out any foreign body material. Um, depending on how deep it is, you know, obviously if it's full thickness, that means repair in the OR. If it's partial and superficial, you can leave them alone. If they're a little deeper, you probably still want to take them back to the OR for suturing. Um, you want to place a shield on the eye prior uh, to going back to the OR. Um, you could consider um, IV antibiotics. Um, but more importantly, you want to make sure the patient is NPO. So if you're, you know, you get a call from community uh, ER that there's a patient coming in with a ruptured globe, you want to tell them make sure they're NPO. Okay, so moving on to chronic diseases, blepharitis, there's anterior and posterior types. With anterior, you'll see collarettes around the eyelashes. And so when I see this, lid scrubs are very effective. If it's posterior, you'll see meibomian gland inspissation or blockage, and warm concresses are effective for this. Um, and artificial tears um, are going to be the main student of treatment in addition to warm compresses. Um, you can also consider fish oil, oral fish oil, um, oral doxycycline or minocycline, and an antibiotic ointment to the lashes. Um, dry eyes, um, oftentimes, is, there is concurrent um, blepharitis or meibomian gland dysfunction. And the symptoms of this are going to be tearing, dryness, redness, foreign body sensation. If there's fluctuating vision during the day, that's a hint that this is uh, dry eye. Um, classically, there's an evaporative um, etiology where um, my, my mobile glands get clogged, and so that lipid layer is uh, not really present, and the tears are evaporating very quickly. You can also have diminished tear secretion, as seen with sarcoidosis and collagen vascular diseases. Um, and there's a high associ association of dry eyes with um, ocular surface inflammation. So clinically, you'll see interpalpebral staining. Um, this is showing rose bengal staining. Um, there'll be a low tear film. Um, oftentimes, you'll see mucus floating around in the tear film. That's a sign that there's dry eye. Um, and you'll see a low tear breakup time. So the way you do this test of tear breakup time is you put in a drop of fluorescein, you get them up to the slit lamp, put on the cobalt blue light, and you tell them, you kind of time it, and you can even time it in your head, um, ask them to stare and not blink. And so you count in your head how many seconds go by before you start seeing a breakup of the tear film, which is seen as a dark spot on um, the cobalt blue light. And if that uh, breakup time is less than 10 seconds, that is a low tear breakup time. If it's greater than 10 seconds, it's normal. Um, you can also do a Schirmer's test. I typically have abandoned Schirmer's just because you can see if there is dry eye based on other, um, other uh, exam um, uh, findings. But um, if you do a uh, Schirmer's test, I do use it with anesthetic. And if you, you, so you put the filter paper strips in and then you wait five minutes. And if it is less than 10 millimeters, um, then that is a low Schirmer's uh, finding. Um, treatment, um, various treatments, ranging from just taking breaks when you're reading at the computer, humidifier, artificial tears, um, gel or ointment at night. 
Um, you can uh, consider topical anti-inflammatory treatment with Restasis or Zydra, but these do take time to work. Um, oral fish oil or olive oil um, can be effective. And um, you can consider moisture chamber goggles if there's a component of nighttime lag of um, I'll typically suggest gel and ointment and humidifier for those cases. Um, and you can also consider punctal plugs and cautery down the road. Um, lots more to say about these conditions. I'm just kind of breezing through. So um, there'll be hopefully more lectures in the future about these. Um, with Fuchs dystrophy, there is this is an autosomal dominant corneal dystrophy that appears typically around age 40 to 50s. And Fuchs dystrophy is a progressive loss of endothelial cells, which leads to corneal edema. And it is asymptomatic in mild cases. Um, and later on, there is morning blurry vision um, that improves later in the day. And the reason why you get that particular symptom is that um, there's basically edema in the morning. So eyes are closed all night. There's kind of a more kind of humid environment and there's more, um, those endothelial cells are just, there's not enough of them to pump out all the fluid. And so when they wake up, they, they're looking through maybe just a little bit of a cloudy cornea. Um, and this is a pathologic sh uh, slide showing um, that there's few endothelial cells here. And then you see these little bumps in Desmase membrane. And these are the guttata that you'll see in Fuchs dystrophy. <clears throat> so gutte or guttata are the first sign. Um, you'll see these little bumps. It looks almost like a kind of an orange peel appearance on the endothelium. Um, and then later on, you'll see corneal bullet um, and edema. And there's two ways you can see these um, guttata. They're, it's hard to find, especially when if you're kind of medical student or just kind of beginning in your residency. And the easiest way is that you have to turn the beam on to the higher intensity. You're not going to see guttata on the, the kind of lower intensity beam. So higher intensity. Um, put it at a slip beam, focus on the endothelium, and you'll see kind of this appearance here. This is retroillumination, so you can put the beam on retroillumination, and that can also highlight guttata. Um, typically, in more, um, say, moderate to advanced Fuchs dystrophy, you'll have a thick cornea that will be greater than 600 microns, and you can do specular microscopy, which is a way to image the corneal endothelium and there'll be a lower than normal uh, corneal endothelial cell count. Uh, so treatment, if they're asymptomatic, I do nothing. But I'll mention that they have this condition um, and that, that they will need some routine um, eye exams to monitor. If they start getting blurry vision in the morning, I recommend the use of hypertonic saline, which is Mira 128. Um, and this hypertonic saline can decrease corneal edema. And since patients will have these symptoms more in the morning, I tell them to kind of use more of this in the morning. Um, there are special considerations in cataract surgery. Um, you want to protect the endothelium as much as possible. Um, you want to decrease phacal time, kind of coat the endothelium. So there's um, things that you want to watch out for um, with cataract surgery. If the Fuchs dystrophy is visually significant, then endothelial ker keratoplasty is recommended. Um, so lastly, I want to go over kind of special cases that you'll see in the burn unit. Um, so you'll see uh, thermochemical burns as well as um, SJS tens. Um, so with thermal burns, I mean it's kind of obvious what the causes are. Um, usually the globe is not involved um, because of the eyelid reflex. So people, you know, you're going to close your eyes. Um, so usually there's more eyelid involvement with thermal burns, um, which can be quite extensive. Uh, chemical burns can be from any form, solids, liquids, or gases. Alkali agents will usually penetrate deeper than acids. Um, the reason for this is that acids actually cause a coagulation necrosis um, that prevents deeper progression of that acid. Alkali um, agents cause saponification of fatty acids, which actually cause uh, cellular disruption and allows that alkali agent to penetrate deeper into the tissues. Um, so acutely, definitely want to irrigate. Um, you can check the pH. I think there was, someone was asking me the other day about pH paper. I don't, did you guys ever find it? I forget who it was who was asking me. <laughs> it's somewhere, hopefully. And I've had like kind of defective pH paper that showed like a very base number, regardless of what was added. So you can always check it on your own eye if you're not sure. <laughs> so to test if it's actually working. Um, you want to do a complete eye exam, look at the eyelids, look for edema and lagophthalmos and lash loss. Um, you want to check to see if there's a good Bell's reflex, if there is lagophthalmos. So this is a patient with very extensive 
facial burns, um, but thankfully he has a good uh, Bell's reflex, even though he has a lot of light ophthalmos. Um, you want to look at the conjunctival cornea and vortices, um, assess the epi defects, clean out um, any foreign bodies, um, and see if there's any opacities. Uh, and then most importantly with chemical burns, um, you want to note the level of limbal ischemia. And limbal ischemia uh, means that there's a loss of limbal stem cells and portends a poor prognosis. So here are two pictures of two different eyes, one with um, this limbal blanching, one that looks very red, and so the eye that actually looks very red and beefy has a better prognosis than the one that's not red. Um, there are several late complications to ocular burns. Um, you can get persistent corneal epithelial defects because of limbal stem cell deficiency. You can get corneal thinning and perforation, corneal neovascularization. On the conjunctiva, you can see scarring and some blepharon formation. On the eyelids, there can be progressive scarring, um, cicatricial ectropion, um, trachiasis, and ligophthalmos. Uh, so the treatment, um, vitamin C and doxycycline can be effective. Um, the doxycycline actually has, uh, oral doxycycline has an anti-inflammatory effect. Um, the eyelids um, do need to be lubricated, um, and you can use erythromycin ointment. Uh, use a topical fluoroquinolone if there is any corneal epithelial defect. And um, if there is, I actually highly consider using a topical steroid, especially in the first couple weeks after a burn, to reduce inflammation. If there is a persistent epi defect, you can consider bandage contact lenses, amniotic membrane, either sutured or non-sutured, such as a Procara. Um, if there is lagophthalmos, then you want to do very aggressive lubrication, like ointment Q1 hour, moisture chamber goggles around the clock. Um, you want to get oculoplastics involved. Unfortunately, you can't really go in surgically acutely because there's oftentimes a lot of um, scarring that occurs late. So if there is lagophthalmos, often the patients do need to wait a while um, before they can get their eyelids treated. So in severe cases, consider the inpatient use of scleral lenses, which we'll talk about. So um, scleral lenses for inpatient use. So we use this for exposure keratopathy with recurrent or non-healing epithelial defects, or if there's corneal thinning and scarring that are refractive, uh, refractory to other treatments, um, there is a much less risk of infection with scleral lenses than with soft bandage contact lenses. We do have a protocol here. I think it's on the box resident folder, correct? So um, let me know personally if you're thinking about using um, scleral lenses. I feel like it got used maybe only once or twice, though, maybe once last year. It doesn't come up very often. Oh, yeah, two years ago. So maybe none last year. Maybe not. Okay. So hopefully the scleral lenses are somewhere, I don't know if they're in the resident room, hopefully they're somewhere safe. So sounds like we need to ask Tina if, make sure they're still around. <laughs> because there's a whole protocol about what you need to do to take care of the scleral lenses. Um, next we're going to switch gears to um, Stevens-Johnson syndrome slash toxic epidermal necrolysis. Um, so this is a rare, potentially life-threatening hypersensitivity condition that's triggered by medications or infections. There is sloughing of the skin and mucous membranes, and the definitive diagnosis is by skin biopsy, which is done inpatient. Um, SJS involves typically 10 to 30 percent of total body surface area, whereas TENS involves greater than 30 percent. And this is a patient um, who actually um, looks this way. Um, it's not that her, her face is red. She actually has no skin, so there's no epithelium here. That's why they have this look. So it's very, very severe. I mean, they're in the burn unit because it's almost like they have burns because they, you know, have their skin has left off. Um, there is a high association of uh, ocular involvement in SJS. Um, you see conjunctival inflammation, pseudomembranes, uh, conjunctival and corneal epithelial defects. Late complications are severe. There is severe dry eyes because of the loss of goblet cells and often meibomian glands. Um, there is keratinization of the eyelid margin. Um, there is scarring of the conjunctiva and cornea, some blepharon, corneal opacities, corneal thinning and perforation, and corneal neovascularization. Uh, the treatment um, will be lubrication and topical steroids, um, and then you want to consider amniotic membrane transplantation over the bulbar and palpebral conjunctiva, cornea, and over the eyelid margins if there is significant inflammation and sloughing. And um, this amniotic membrane is human amniotic membrane. 
Um, it is harvested from women who undergo have undergone C-sections and have elected to donate their placentas. And so the amniotic membrane contains growth factors, anti-inflammatory mediators to promote healing and reduce inflammation. And it also prevents these very late complications. Um, so there is a new grading system for when to do amniotic uh, membrane transplantation um, based on the exam. So notice that it is um, classified into mild, moderate, severe, and extremely severe. Um, it, you want to look at the lid margin. If there is staining of less than one-third of the lid margin, you can just do medical and close observation. Anything bigger than that, you want to consider amniotic, we want to do um, amniotic membrane transplantation in addition to the medical therapy. Um, if there's any corneal epithelial defect, that would be considered severe. Um, if there's staining on the bulbar um, and palpebral conjunctiva of greater than one centimeter, that is considered severe. Um, so, you know, basically let us know about any SJS patients that are out there. Um, here are some pictures of um, SJS patients. This is a picture showing um, severe keratinization. So this is stained with fluorescein, but there's, um, as you can imagine, this can cause um, um, chronic um, and sometimes even debilitating uh, pain and irritation. Um, and this is just showing that there's kind of a little irregularity of the uh, lid margin there. And so when you pull it back, you'll see this. Um, this is a patient who had a really good result. She had um, a young patient with SJS who underwent amniotic membrane um, transplant. And I think it was about a month later. Can't tell that anything even really happened. So she looks great. Um, this is another patient who um, I think had very late um, amniotic membrane um, transplantation with chronic um, scarring and inflammation. So there's a lot of scarring of the palpebral conjunctiva, a lot of chronic inflammation of the conjunctiva in general. Um, I think he had some corneal neovascularization as well. So that is it. Any questions on anything? Well, we're always around. We've got some great corneal fellows this year who can also always help as well. Um, so I think that's about it. Mm -hmm.